my question for you today, I would like you to design Ticketmaster, bad PR notwithstanding. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another segment for Mock Interview with Exponent. Today, I am here with Sam. Would you like to introduce yourself, Sam? Yeah, sure. So um, I said, I'm Sam. I am a senior TPM at Amazon. Um, I specialize in communications um, and also just stakeholder engagement in general. So a bit of a people's person. Uh, I started off as a software engineer and then kind of made my way up uh, to like a team lead, uh, program manager and then like IT team lead program manager esque and then going more into the um, manager role. But I always have that sort of engineering uh, itch that I want to scratch. So I'm um, happy to be here. We're happy to have you. Uh, my question for you today I would like you to design Ticketmaster bad PR notwithstanding. <laughs> okay. Uh, awesome. Okay. So, uh, before I go into it, I guess I wanted to get some clarifying questions, um, okay. before I get started. So, uh, we're essentially talking about a, uh, ticket reservation, uh, system as Ticketmaster is. You're able to go on, uh, view events, um, mm-hmm. and then whatever events are available, go in and pick seats, uh, for the events, depending on which day and time. Uh, the event actually is. So um, for this one, uh, how many events are we selling tickets for? Would you like us to like maybe have a reasonable estimate for it? Yeah, let's come up with an an estimate for what we're dealing with. Okay, cool. Um, And well, just following that trail of thought, um, it would just depend on which event that we do go to. So uh, maybe we can see if we can look at two types of events, like a relatively small event and then a Mm -hmm. bigger event. So small events would have like at the most, maybe a thousand tickets and a bigger event would have, you know, go up to 50,000 just to be on the, you know, a relatively safe side. Okay. Okay. Um, Yeah. Cool. And then, uh, well, users, when you come in, you think of Ticketmaster, um, you either have the option of um, actually creating the profile, which is, you know, um, buying the tickets as a guest. So um, maybe it'd be good to have an option for users to do that because we don't want to force them to actually create a, um, a user profile if they don't want to. So I think that would be um, important. Cool. And then... Um, I guess at the end, I think for looking at this, one thing I really want to focus on is the uh, purchasing side. Um, there are a couple of scenarios in which I think we may need to tackle, especially if we have a you know um, relatively big um, system like this, which we'll mm-hmm. encounter. So it'd be good to do that. So um, I'll share my screen and then just kind of write down those uh, functional sure. requirements. That we just so uh, right now, just want to look at the. Um, functional requirements and uh so right so we're going to be creating a scalable um secret reservation system uh where i guess the users can let's see so they'll be able to they said browse uh events and then select uh you know, seats based on the events. And then obviously you want them to buy the seats. And then finally, I think we said we're going to give them the option um, to, like, you know, uh, make a, a user profile. And that would be important uh, just moving on because if users want to, you know, come back again and re um, buy more tickets, like if we have the uh, option for them to, you know, um, store payment info that yeah. would be handy so that they don't have to keep, um, you know, typing in their info for that. So, cool. Um, this looks good. I'll, I would like to move on to the API endpoints. I think that like sounds this. good. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, so, let's see. Well, Obviously, the main main thing here is uh, events. So what we'd want to do is um, have 
a events API endpoint, um, which would, you know, kind of uh, get the list of available, uh, you know, uh, events which are currently, yeah, which are currently available. Um, okay. So I'm going to do this for lack of. Get list of avail. It's all right. Events. Um, and then, well, okay. So if you're going to be doing that, we need something to. Uh, oops. We need something to um, get the event details. So that's going to be taking in some sort of uh, event ID. Um, and then that ID can you know give us the details uh, of the specific um, event, and then well, you said we also need to uh, reserve uh, available seats. So this endpoint would yeah just get the available seats, and that will take in the event. Uh, ID and you know that would go to the like, uh, seats as well to, to get that. And is this event ID different for every instance of, of, of a larger event or is it for the like let's say there's a comedy show is is it a different ID for like the Saturday night show the Sunday show or is it for the whole instance? Oh I see yeah so in this case it'll probably be um, for like uh, d depending on how we um, do the the specific uh, database later on, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. this event ID would most likely be for like a main one, and then if the data is sharded into specific events uh, based on dates, so, um, that could be a thing later Got on. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, and then once you know they've they've picked the uh, events, we we'll want to uh, reserve. Oh. Event and ID we want to just reserve the um, seat of the event. Uh, well, so seats, and then that would also have a seat ID, which we can then uh, reserve. Cool. Um, and then if we go on and we want to give them the option to um, register and log in, you know, that would be a uh, endpoint. I'm still getting used to a whimsical, but uh, <laughs> it would be a uh, re like an imp uh, a post HTTP method where users would be allowed to register with their um, own information. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can extend that to like login stuff, but I just want to cover the the basics right now. Um, so just moving okay. on to purchases. And um, that would also be opposed to, you know, post the um, purchase record or create the purchase record of um, when a user buys a seat for a specific event. Um, and then, you know, you can okay. go in further to see if you can, you know, check the history of the previous events that they, um, yeah. they got. Okay, cool. So looks like we have that. It's great. Um, and I ideally, um, I think now would be a good time to actually kind of estimate the system size. So if we, if we do that real quick, um, and I'm, we're just going to do that simply by um, breaking down what the, uh, the, the questions. So first question would be the, how many events, right? Um, and I look at uh, something a similar ticket reservation system like uh, AMC or even Ticketmaster. Mm -hmm. um, what the users are usually allowed to buy the tickets like three months in advance, right? Mm -hmm. So if we assume that, um, and this is just an assumption, like on any given day there are um, two hundred events. Then what we can do is with the uh, that first assumption of um, 
the buying the tickets three months in advance. Uh, we can then actually just um, we can then actually uh, calculate uh, on average like how how many events uh, there'll be. So it'll be two hundred events uh, multiplied by uh, thirty days a month, and then multiply that by three months, uh, which gives about, you know, um, 18,000 events. Um, but just to be on the safe side, we're just going to make that um, just for calculate, make the calculations a little easier, uh, 20,000 events that we have. Um, and so now we have over like, a three month period. Yeah. Worldwide. Th okay. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Maybe I should have clarified that before. Um, this. Yeah. So any given day, um, if we, yeah, I was actually looking at probably numbers within like the, the US, but if we do it worldwide, those would be great. So I just want to get like that's fine. We can, I think you can limit it to the US for now. I think that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So yeah. Uh, we have the events and then we think of how many um, tickets uh, for each event. And uh, when we spoke earlier, we had mentioned that. There were going to be two types of events, right? A relatively small event, which would have, um, you know, probably a max of a thousand tickets per event, and then um, a big event, which would have essentially like twenty or oh, we said fifty, fifty thousand uh, tickets. Now, obviously, the number of small events are going to outweigh the them are big events. So let's say um, out of all the events, a quarter of them are relatively big events. So that's, you know, your really high end famous, um, like if it's a concert, famous person coming in, say Swifty or Beyonce coming in, um, those would be a relatively big uh, event. And what we can do here is now just uh, calculate if a quarter of these 20,000 events are um, big, then we would have essentially that 20, um, that 50,000 tickets multiplied by uh, the 5,000 events, which comes from the 20,000 being uh, the quarter of the 20,000. Um, so we have like, oops, like 15, oh, not 15, it's 20, yeah, uh, 25. Ten to seven uh, tickets, and then for the um, bigger one, that's going to be fifteen thousand. Can we just break down that that uh, last calculation that you did? What is the twenty-five? What's the ten? And what's the seven? Yeah, sure. Um, so this came from um, we have fifty tickets that are for one big event. And then um, we know that in total, we have 20,000 tickets, I mean, 20,000 uh, events, and a quarter of those okay. events are big. So then we would multiply the okay. um, 50,000 tickets by the 5,000 events. Got it. Okay. Sounds good. Cool. And then um, similarly here, since that's 5,000, there's 15,000 um, tickets. Oh, 15,000 uh, events that are big. So we would also just multiply, um, or small, sorry, 15,000 tickets that are small. So we'll multiply um, the tickets and the events, which would give us in total um, about 15, 15 to 10 to the six, yeah, 10 to the six uh, tickets. So this is the amount um, that the systems kind of, you know, tickets the systems kind of dealing with um, over the course of those three months. So oh, that's a power sign. That's why. I was yes. Thinking. Yes. Okay, got it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, what okay. are we multiplying? Okay. Got yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> You're good. All right. <laughs> okay. Cool. Um, so looking at this, there's actually um, a couple of observations here. One. Um, the larger events are 
way, there are way more tickets for the bigger events um, than the smaller events. Um, so I think for, for, for this use case, we might just uh, focus on the, on managing um, big event tickets. Okay. Okay. And, um, you know, so if we kind of break this down into days, if my math is correct, then what we would have is um, per day, we're looking at around, it's like two point some something, but I think we'll just round it to uh, three to the six tickets a day um, that the system's kind of dealing with. Um, actually, no, let's, let's just make it four, just for um, my safe. Um, so it's going to be for about yeah for four million tickets a day um, that we're gonna just kind of deal with, and then the second thing we're gonna do is actually um, oh, this, yeah the second thing would be uh, checking the traffic. Um, traffic won't be consistent. Uh, if you look now, for example, I don't think there's any major events going on, but. Um, Last month, actually, the past two months, um, Beyonce has been touring. And I actually went to go see her, which was nice. great. Uh, Lucky. <laughs> <artist. Yeah. laughs> but um, it's you. You notice that those uh, that traffic, like it's a flood with those popular events. Yeah. So we we have to be mindful that out of these big events, um, there are some that are actually. Uh, popular, and I'll say maybe a, a quarter are uh, um, popular events, and um, they usually sell like I would say like under ten minutes. So we just got to be mindful that as we go on, we need to um, be aware that that's that's uh, they yeah that's like a million tickets that's been sold and under like. 10 minutes, which is about, yeah. you know, a uh, uh, hundred thousand tickets a minute. Um, so as we move on, just have to be mindful that um, that's a thing that we may need to um, keep and remember. Yeah. Cool. So now we've kind of have like an estimate of the system and the data that we may have uh, it might be good to look at the data schema for the um, the database. So, Sounds good. Cool. So let's focus on that data uh, schema. Um, first one would be, well, we would have the uh, events, right? And leave this, no. Um, the events and uh, you know, you would have a, I hear, I'm just thinking of the um, things that we would need. So obviously for an event, you would, uh, it, it would need some sort of uh, like unique, unique ID or like I mean, for this case, like this could be an, an oh, let me just primary key. And as I'm thinking, um, I'll, I'll probably come back to this again, but it's gonna be, uh, a lot of this data would be relational because if you think of yeah. events, um, one event can have many seats. So it's a, a one to uh, many relationships. So I'm thinking of also yeah. having some foreign keys in here too, so that they can um, be connected. And then um, obviously we want the event date. Um, and that could actually just be a... Uh, timestamp. Uh, we got the event name, obviously. And actually, let me just write all these down. So event venue and like some event description. Um, and all these could be uh, cars. If I want to be really specific, we could just make these two for six. Two for six. And the description is a little longer, so maybe uh, like 2048. Um, and maybe if we uh, yeah, have time, I can like 
will go specifically mm-hmm. to h- how much, um, how many bytes like a um, an entry would actually, you know, be. Um, yeah. We can just move on. Can I do this? I'm curious if I can. Oh, nice. Okay. Cool. Uh, so just following that, you would have the uh, seat. So um, for seat, you have the seat uh, ID, and that mm-hmm. also can be uh, an int. And then um, I was just wondering too, because um, for seats, it's, uh, to make it sometimes easier, they have the seat sections. Um, and mm. also determine how much the specific ticket is. Um, yeah. And stuff. So uh, that could be an int. Uh, we have the seat row, uh, seat number, mm-hmm. and obviously we can't forget the the seat price. Now, yeah. Additionally to this, um, may want to see if. Uh, like when it comes to purchasing, is if a seat is available. Um, I'm brainstorming some stuff that we may need to change on this uh, table, okay. but for now, um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll just keep it as is, and then as we move on, I might change that. So just correcting okay. these right now. Uh, this would be an int. Uh, Cinnamon would be an int, and then here we go. oh. oh. Uh, seat price would be a double, and what we have would be uh, if it's uh, available, and that would be a, a, a boolean to check if the seat is like available or not. And then um, what we have here is an event ID. Oh, no, here what we have here is an event uh, ID, which would be mm-hmm. that. Um, allow me. Okay. That is interesting. It's not allowing me to put. Okay. Well, what I'm trying to put in here is a okay. int, uh, which would be a foreign key to um, whatever uh, event the seat is um, part of. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. And then um, let me. See if I can yes. Okay. And then uh, another one we can look at is the uh, what we need to add is a uh, a user, obviously. So for a user, we need a user ID. Um, a user would also have a name and a password, which would probably be like a a SHA two fifty six hash. Um, just for security purposes. Yeah, and we're saying that the users do have to have a profile before they, or an account rather, before they start buying tickets. Um, no, actually, hmm, that's a good point. So there, th- so there, there are two options. One, they, one is like they, they can actually go ahead and 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 make one. Um, but in the mm-hmm. case that they don't, um, what we can do is. Oh, well, what we can do is actually, um, I was thinking of creating a second table, which would mm-hmm. be for um, purchases. And then that would hold a, um, a purchase user uh, ID. Actually, let me, let me uh, create that and then kind of go into, um, kind of okay. answer that, that question. Sure. So, uh, yeah, let me uh, just do this. Show two fifty six, um, and then oh right, uh, and then actually this would just have the user uh, credit card number, and then um, user credit card gets expiration date, and then I, on, honestly I, I won't do it for now. But what could happen is that just for security purpose, you can just uh, separate. Um, the user and then the user um, card information in a separate uh, table. Mm-hmm. So they'll be yeah. able to, um, well, just for security reasons. Okay, but to focus on what we were um, talking about, I, th- I think it's 
it, it is important if we did a uh, purchase table uh, okay. because what because then what we can do is um, it's okay. Uh, so print purchase tables will allow two things. Uh, one would be allow users to refund tickets. It's a bit more flexible that way. And then users can purchase more than one uh, seat. So the um, the purchase ticket would have in here, uh, if I can just mm -hmm. do this real quick. Um, yeah, so the, the purchase uh, would have like a, um, the user ID, so whoever bought the, the ticket, um, and that would just connect from key. Um, and then purchase event ID as well. And, yeah. Okay. And then also a, uh, obviously, um, the thing that the purchase the uh, CID, that would also be a, uh, uh foreign key. Yeah. So um I, yeah, but so actually to to answer your question, uh how do we essentially handle purchases from people with no accounts because that's the option that we're given. Um there are two mm -hmm. options. Uh the first one is that we make uh when a a user who isn't part of the system already uh buys or purchases a ticket, mm -hmm. uh we make purchase purchase user ID null. Um you know, because they okay. don't exist. The only, the only caveat there is, it's going to be hard um, when it comes to looking up the payment info of earlier purchases from that same user, for example. Yeah, yeah. Fund. Um, so what we could do instead is that when a new entry is used, uh, created, or a user uh, makes a purchase, um, we assign a unique user ID um, to that, uh, user, but we leave mm -hmm. username and password blank. That way, payment info on purchase tickets can still be tracked by um, the same user. Got it. And if the user wants to retrieve their tickets um, at a later date without having an account, what would they need to do to, to pull those up? Oh, so um, if you think about the way it's done now, um, they there's usually a... Um, Let's see. Oh, uh, there's usually like a ticket, uh, like confirmation. So usually like a user is sent a, uh, like confirmation of the ticket and, um, okay. what that ticket, uh, like number is or, um, something like that. So there could be an option where, okay. um, it's associated to the seat ID and, um, okay. that can be used to, um, just retrieve the previous, um, Got it. payments. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So kind of like how a flight ticket works. Yeah. So um, essentially uh, what we have so far is um, the user goes to the site or the app, picks one of the listed events, um, and then picks an available seat in that event and um, either logs in, enters the payment info and confirms the purchase. And the seat is either marked sold um, or you know, uh, and then uh, the payment ensues and there's an update on the purchase table. Now, um, the thing I was thinking about was, because this is, if you think of uh, cases where you have a huge event, um, you can run into issues handling multiple users, right? Ideally, the ideal condition for us would be um, person A checks to see uh, if a seat is free and then the seat's free and confirms the purchase and has the tickets for that seat. And then person okay. B comes later on, is checking, sees that the seat, if the seat's free and it's not free, um, mm. and, this, and the seat looks taken, so person B just looks for another seat. Fortunately, that's usually not the case, especially have, as you thinking of those um, bigger events where you have yeah. a lot of people going for maybe one specific seat um and yeah, yeah. uh you yeah you run into a, a race condition there so yeah uh, yeah so there i think there are, there are four race conditions when you 
we think about this. The first one is um, kind of the a read modify uh, write, and in that uh, multiple users will want to purchase the same seat, but um, and the system must perform like a read uh, write operation to see mm -hmm. uh, to update the seats availability status, and uh, this involves you know checking that the seats available, marking it as booked, and then storing that uh, booking information. Um, mm -hmm. Right, and then the second one is a simultaneous request, um, and I, I remember in and when I was in college, uh, I went to University of Virginia, and we were like a huge basketball team and mm. uh, school. And uh, every time Duke University would come over, I could never get a seat. I would have to sit there and refresh yeah. all day. And then one time, I would. It would see, say the ticket's available. I'll go through, click it, verify my card. Whoops, my card isn't here. Go, bring oh, my God. card, finally put it in, click purchase, and then it says the seat's unavailable. Um, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, and that can be very uh, frustrating. Um, so in this case, for the simultaneous request, if two users submit a purchase request almost at the same time, um, mm -hmm. the system you know, may not have completed the first person's um, reservation before processing the second one's request. Yeah, um, yeah. And then, so that's, yeah, that's the simultaneous uh, request. Uh, and then the third which you hear often with these is uh, concurrency. So okay. since the operations of doing this, like I was saying all these uh, mortal steps on um, atomic, essentially that's the word, um, which can instead they consist of multiple steps. Uh, it's possible for both requests to check the seat's availability um, and find it available, even though it's only available for one user. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to run all the other. Okay, so we have that. And then I would say, and then the final one would be uh, double booking, which is a big no-no. You don't want to turn up to an event, which has happened quite a bit to me sometimes. Uh, and you have the On same- On Ticketmaster? Uh, it was it Ticketmaster. It was something close. Oh, no, you know what? It was uh, it was AMC. I think I was open night to go see the Spider-Man movie. And um, yeah, yeah. yeah, somehow uh, there must have been like a, a delay because I bought it online and someone bought it at the um, movie theater, which I don't even know how they were able to get an opening night, but somehow it was. That's my step. Um, in the end, I did get a uh, one of those like the disabled seats, so it was a little bit nicer, I guess, because they're pushing those. <laughs> um, but okay. it, 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 it was it was decent. So um, yeah. anyway, so double so double booking can also be um, a common issue. Uh, mm -hmm. So we'd have to think of ways to mitigate. Uh, those actual, those risks. And um, one thing I can think of is one, we would have to ensure that there's data consistency. Um, so mm -hmm. if a transaction um, fails at any step, what we talked about, um, it will roll back and prevent the, the seat from even getting booked. Um, and that has to be you know consistent. And then also something that guarantees um, the Atomosity, so I, don't know, I think it's a word, um, where multiple users cannot concurrently modify the same uh, seat uh, in mm -hmm. a way that leads to you know the double booking. So one way we can do that, I uh, thinking would be a um, an acid base, uh, well, an acid database um, where we have transactions that are sequenced um, and you know, one or more SQL operations are treated as one single unit of work. Um, yeah. So that one day, you know, they are executed. Um, they either all pass or, or fail. We don't want either or. Um, yeah. And in context of booking a seat, a transaction um, might and probably should include check-in seat availability, reserving the seat, and then record the booking. Um, so there are uh, well, like one uh, asset uh, database to think of is uh, Postgres, 
um, that yeah. would work pretty well. The trade-off with this, though, is that um, we have to be mindful of deadlocks, right? Because poorly managed transactions would lead to that, um, where two or more transactions are waiting indefinitely, and then you have a C, which is available to, to no one. Um, okay. Cool. So that's that's one thing. But then we'll, I, I think a second solution that can be coupled with this. Um, so uh, I think we said. So I said uh, this. This graph. Um, this, this. Sorry. The second one uh, would be uh, optimistic locking, and uh, the way that works is. Um, it will rely on either a version number or a timestamp associated with, you know, the C when it, at which point it had been reserved. So when a user attempts to book a C, the system checks uh, the C version was timestamp before confirming the booking. Um, if another user okay. has already booked the C, um, or no, updated this version of the timestamp, the system can detect whether the if there's a conflict and, you know, ultimately reject that action. Yeah. Cool. Um, so is there any trade-offs for that? Honestly, the only thing is probably annoyance. Like I was saying, if a user, like, they may need to try to, you know, redo their booking if it's, um, if there's a conflict um, and if they end up, you know, if you're the unlucky person that keeps getting the conflict, it could, you can get yeah. the after a while. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, so I guess that's the trade off that you're making here. Yes. That's, yeah. So that's a trade off I'm making. Um, so to actually implement that in the, uh, the, the database here, what we can do here is in, I guess, in the seat. Right here, we have it's available or not. That will not be able to tell us you know, um, if it's been reserved right now. Mm -hmm. um, so what we can do is we can change this to a, mm. like a, a status. So we have a uh, seat status and this would be an in and essentially uh, seat status would be, uh, if it's, let's say if it's one, then the seats, uh, available. Okay. Right. Uh, if it's, oh, sorry, zero. If it's one, it's reserved. And then if it's two, um, it's, it's purchased. Yeah. Um, now, oh, and then, uh, let's see, there was one Oh yeah, and then uh, we we can also add here a uh, insert a row. Hello, can I just click enter? Um, we can implement either versioning or a timestamp. Uh, I think for this we'll just go for a timestamp here. Um, so, and ideally we'll need both of these because the mm -hmm. timestamp will let us know if it's been reserved, the status will actually yeah. let us know if it's available or not. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking because we will still have to enforce it. So that logic thinking, so, what, what, okay, I'll, I have two things. So the first thing we could do is we can frequently go through the seat table and find all the entries mm -hmm. uh, where seat status is equal to one and selection time is, oh, and let's say uh, you can reserve a ticket for 10 minutes. Right? Okay. And let's say the selection time is uh, greater than 10 minutes. If that condition is met, then what would happen is we can reset both the seat status to zero so it's available again, and then um, just reset that timestamp um, to null. Okay. Uh, the, only thing, because I, as you can see, I don't know if you've noticed, but I like to go a little fast. Uh, the, so a trade of that, I, I think I might want to do is, uh, instead of doing all that, though it makes a really tidy database, because it's, you know, it's always on point, um, there's the extra overhead 
of scanning mm. right, queries mm -hmm. and updates. So instead, we could just say, um, change that logic to if a seat status is uh, equal to zero or seat status is equal to one and uh, selection time is greater than 10, then we can allow the user to modify the yeah. uh, seat. So that way you're getting rid yeah. of the overhead entirely for that. Got it, okay. Cool. I think this uh, looks good. Um, do you have any, how do you wanna, how do you wanna wrap up? Um, cool, I can uh, go ahead and do the, um, like kind of what the overall database, uh, the whole system can look like. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay. So yay, time to put this into boring. Okay, so let's just say here we have a uh, user and um, yeah, one, one thing that I didn't uh, bring up because we kind of ran out of time is, uh, well, since you have a lot of like traffic coming in, um, we would wanna include a something that can um, distribute the traffic. So uh, in yeah. this case, we can use a, a you know, uh, AWS, like Elastic Load Balancer, and that will just allow us, like any, um, if, even if traffic to come through, it can distribute to um, whatever service. And, um, you know, that can be done through consistent hashing, um, the yeah, yeah. round robin, but um, yeah, I think that just, and then, uh, since I want to maybe just keep it, you know, uh, a AWS, uh, we could, EC2 is a great um, tool for um, auto scaling. So um, it would be able to, if you think of this, we don't know how many traffic coming up, but we need enough service to kind of um, carry the load. So yeah. um, EC2 would allow um, that, uh, bringing up a uh, service kind of on the fly. So okay. cool. So once we have that, uh, we'll have the, uh, the different uh, service up here. So we have web server. Here. Um, and yeah, something like something I think I didn't I didn't get to, um, but we one thing to optimize the um, database, which we said we'd, we'd progress mm -hmm. would be using um, a a cache uh, to get the most popular requests. So in this case, it would be okay. um, events most frequently used, and um, making sure that cache is also most updated too. Got it. Like the most frequently visited events that people are yes. searching up. Correct. Got it. Um, and then also uh, one more thing I, I'm going to share here, but I can say it whilst I'm doing this, um, is mm -hmm. also optimizing the um, to optimize the uh, database too. Mm -hmm. uh, we could have a index to help querying um so that we can uh like kind of get uh the most frequently like if we if a user we we get in the same sort of query frequently a user an index can be used to help that uh query yeah. uh, run quick um you know okay. and so you trade us with that you have to be very selective because um queries make oh indexes take space to do as well so Do that here. Um, and then, oh, yeah, we said that we were going to have a Postgres. Uh, um, and yeah, this would have uh, replicas to. Uh, for reading, mm -hmm. 
and um, yeah, let me. Yeah, and okay. I imagine this is an error coming to that one too. Um, yeah. yeah, and uh, and then one last night I did want to mention too. Um, mm -hmm. There is one thing we spoke about earlier was that we for those popular events they're going to be a lot of um, like. Uh, read and write in traffic coming through. Um, yeah. So it would be important um, to have a, uh, to to make sure that we had something on like, it's that's about 1600 uh, requests per second coming in at, at peak loads. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it would be imp like important, I'm thinking of the, uh, like backups for the database, so we have to, um, and also including a, uh, a a RAM, I would say, um, because uh, looking at what we had, it's not a very they're not very huge uh, tables, um, so okay. we can use the uh, as the uh, the Postgres database. Um, but also fit all the data in a uh, SSD um, and okay. an SSD card for that. And then we can um, even like go as far as to add a, um, a RAM and set that data in periodically. Um, now, you may be wondering, Got it. Okay. yeah, is that RAM going to be fast enough? Um, well, like mm. it's going to need 1,600 operations. Um, yeah. And a general purpose RAM would take about 3,000 um, input, uh, output operations, um, but a specialized one could yeah. take 30,000. So I think we'll be, um, good on, on that front. To have that part of your system. Yes. Um, and then one last thing, um, RAM is volatile. So if yeah. you lose the power, you like lost everything. So I think, um, yeah. we, it may be good to also add a inter uninterruptible, um, power source there to uh, power supply. Got it. Um, so that, okay. it, you know, once it's down, it still has a couple of minutes to put everything in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. if we ever move our general elections, uh, political <laughs> elections online, I feel like Ticketmaster should probably take a stab at <laughs> designing that. <laughs> that would be interesting. Because it is just as important. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. Um, Cool. Thank you so much, Sam. This is it's a very complex system. So thanks for thanks for working through all the details. Um, how do you feel? And do you have any thoughts or recommendations, suggestions to give to people who come across a question like this? Yeah, sure. Um, so as you can see, like, um, it's very easy for a person to get kind of engulfed in um, or like have a specific uh, trail of thought going into a program like this, because there's a lot you can talk about. Um, yeah. You, you know, and sometimes you feel like, oh, I haven't talked enough about this specific thing. But sometimes the uh, interviewer will tell you, ask you specific questions about the specific parts, and you just need to yeah. go more in it because they want to focus on it. And it also depends on the role you're applying for. Um, for example, if I was in more for a security role, I'd probably talk more about how I would deal with, um, you know, the, I said I separated the, um, the payment, um, uh, security part of that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Also, if it was something that had to deal with customer satisfaction, which is something that a lot of companies go for, I may have introduced something like, um, website socketing, or probably most likely long pooling, um, so that users mm -hmm. can know, uh, you know, if they're waiting in line, uh, where they are. Um, and then one yeah, more thing, yeah. could have talked about, uh, you know, message queues, because that's something that also helps with um, a huge system like this. So it can be easy yeah. to get, like saying, o overwhelmed with this, but um, your trail of thought, having, talking with your um, interviewer is, is pretty, um, yeah, just kind of go with the flow mm -hmm. because, I mean, the interviewers want you to succeed too. 
Um, and yeah, you, know, yeah. you and I had a little bit of laughter here and there. Um, and <laughs> yeah, your interviewer is potentially someone who you're going to be working with. So treat this like a problem that you're going to be solving with a coworker. Honestly, um, I think that some of the most successful interviews that I've seen are the ones that feel the most like a working relationship with a coworker. Um, and that it gives you a peek into what it's going to be like with, with this other person in the office. So keep that in mind. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sam. This was, this was great. Uh, a very, very simple product in its functionality, not at all simple in its implementation. So thank you very much for walking us through that. I really appreciate it. Um, and good luck with, with everyone who's watching at home with all your interviews. <laughs>